Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. Today, we're going to be reading True Scary Camping Horror Stories. I hope you enjoy them. So without further ado, lay back, relax, and enjoy these true scary stories. I work as a counselor at a summer camp in Southern California. The place is very out in the woods, so we get all sorts of animals wandering through, from deer and foxes, coyotes howling in the distance, to a mountain lion that's been spotted in the area. The camp also occasionally has a spiritual slash haunted vibe. There are a couple of creepy and weird spots, some things in that area that we think show the place has been inhabited in the past, ghost stories, etc. One night after putting my kids to bed, I was standing outside our cabin, talking to another counselor, when my friend Sadie comes running by with her entire teenage girl's cabin, maybe 12 of them, all dressed in black and freaking out. She screams at me that she thought they heard a ghost, and once her kids were asleep, she'd meet me back here to explain and investigate. Sadie is normally the level-headed type not to freak out easily, so this really caught my attention. She meets me back at my cabin, maybe 30 minutes later, and explains what was going on. She took her campers on a night hike, had them all dress up in black, and pretend to be ninjas. All was fun until their way back, they passed a particularly dark part of the trail, when they heard off in the distance, just beyond the tree line what sounded like a faint help from a small child but each time they heard it it got more and more distorted until it no longer sounded human yet still sounded like a child yelling help in the distance naturally they freaked out and ran me and sadie decided to be good counselors and go investigate the sound of a small child yelling help as we walk over to the area of the trail we hear it it doesn't sound like a small child anymore It sounded more like a demon screeching out its best impersonation of a child. And it didn't sound like it was coming from any point source. But more was coming from an entire mountainside. We booked it back to the safety of the main part of camp, where we tell this story to anyone who will listen. The next day, the camp director had a meeting, where they told us to tell our campers not to freak out at the sound of bobcats in the forest. They are harmless but do make a high-pitched yelping sound at night. Our friends wouldn't let us live that one down all summer. My uncle built a house on some small acreage that he has that is pretty far out there. There's not another house within two miles of his at least. And most of that is woods and cow pastures. But his place is beautiful. He built it all by hand and has a wonderful wraparound deck, perfect for family get-togethers. We were all out there, probably 20 adults and five or six kids for a party one day. It was one of those summer times when it's blazing hot out, but the light breeze is cool enough that you don't notice it after a while. I had been there hanging out all day, when I was asked to run into town and grab some more groceries. So I packed up and headed out. I got the groceries and everything was fine. As I drove back, it was starting to get dark and it was at a time of the year when dark comes fast. It was pitch black out there when I finally arrived. As I pull up, I notice something is setting in front of my car, facing the house. It was not disturbed by my headlights but it does glance back at me once. It's a panther, just chilling there, watching the party. And as I sat there for a second watching it, I notice that it has specifically placed itself near the edge where all the kids are running around. After I have my headlights on it for a minute or so, it kind of looked back at me again as if to say, okay, I was caught, oh well. 
and then it gave the most human-looking sigh and just walked off into the woods. I sat there for a bit before building myself up to getting out of the car and going to the party and telling everyone. I went to Guatemala with my girlfriend, did a three-day hike through the jungle to Tikal, slept in a tent at two tiny ranger campsites deep in the woods. During the second night, a massive thunderstorm was coming down above us. At 4 a.m., I woke up and heard some male voices, and I left the tent to check it out. Two guys with rifles approached me, told my girlfriend to stay in the tent because it was scary. She didn't comply and join me. Turns out, those guys were local hunters looking for shelter in the camp. We offered them coffee. They were more than happy. About 30 seconds later, the storm got so intense that a big tree fell and crashed onto our tent. If I had not left to check out the guys or worse, my girlfriend would have listened. We both would be very dead right now. When I was a kid around eight or nine, my mom, grandma, brothers, and I went camping at a small camp about two hours from the town that we lived in. We went there a lot and even had a particular campsite that we had slowly built up over the years. On this particular trip, we had my aunt and uncle's dogs with us since they were doing military tours. They were both very well-trained bird dogs, but usually really calm and friendly the first night on this particular trip. And one of the dogs, Star, starts growling in the tent at about one in the morning. My mom is thinking something is outside and arms herself and investigates with the dogs. As she gets out the tent, Star and Ariel would not let her move to the other edge of the campsite and both get into attack position while hurting my mom towards the car. This is while also keeping themselves in front of the tent. By this point, we're all up, and with a group of kids under 10 freaking out. For a reason she can't even explain today, my mother packs up camp and gets us all into the car to head home. After about 10 minutes out of the campsite, a car starts following us, and the dogs get in the back and just growl. By this point, everyone was in borderline panic mode, and my brothers were crying the entire car ride home. As the town came into view, You have to cross a huge bridge to drive in, and the car was still following us. And as a kid, you make stories to yourself that nothing is wrong, and the car behind you is just full of scared people too. Yet, as we start across the bridge, the car stops and just turns around, speeding back the way we came. We stopped at a gas station, and everyone was near meltdown mode, and my mom goes in to get cigarettes. But Star would not let her back into the car, until she could see her clearly. This, and a camping trip a few years ago, later convinced me that camping is no longer my thing. I had a pretty long stint in the Boy Scouts, and one time we were camping on a reserve in the Midwestern United States. That's normally used in the summer for large sessions, i.e. 1,500 scouts scattered across a large campground. We were camping in October, however, and camp wasn't in session, so it was just our troop of 30 or so guys, plus the adult leaders on this massive, empty reserve. Now, the summer session has a pseudo-Native American society that serves as a leadership-slash-craftsmanship program, sort of an extension of Boy Scouts. The Order of the Arrow would be a similar example. Part of being in the society means crafting a lot of ceremonial outfit type things. So A, you learn how to work with your hands, and B, the ceremonies look pretty cool. Well, it was the last day of our trip, and it had been unusually hot and calm for October. The last thing we do before piling into the cars is a litter line. 
Everyone lines up, and we walk the campsite to ensure we leave no trace. We were walking along when one of the guys says, Hey, I think I found a coup. Now, coup are fairly valuable out there, because they're a specially shaped bead that you can only get when you join the society. Everyone's coup is unique, and it's usually shaped to reflect the person who joined. Whoa, man, what kind of coup is it? Well, it looks like... Or tornado. Whoosh. This cold, hard wind came out of nowhere and started pushing the trees and kicking up leaves everywhere. The timing. What in the heck? Hadn't had so much as a breeze for three days. We decided our litter line was good and got the heck out of there. Society members don't just lose their coup. I wonder what happened. A few friends and I had a long weekend, five days off from school, and we decided to go camping in the North Georgia mountains. We packed a big 10-person tent. There were five of us, two guys, three girls, and we loaded up into my buddy's truck. He and I had some experience being outdoors, camping, hiking, and hunting, and he's an army veteran, so we packed really well and had all sorts of amenities, like a propane stove slash grill fold-up cots, a portable shower, etc. We were in it for the whole weekend. We left Wednesday afternoon and parked the truck in a small town and started hiking into the woods to find a spot. It was a fairly normal hike until we got about four to five miles in. The first time we noticed something strange was when we came into a little clearing in the woods with a big pond slash tiny lake in it. We stepped into the open area and everything stopped. No birds chirping, no squirrels running around, even the clouds and wind seemed to stop moving. My buddy and I both thought, well crap, there's got to be a predator nearby, and took out our handguns. It's the law in Kennesaw, just in case. I've never seen a bear in Georgia, so we figured that it was a mountain lion or maybe some coyotes. My friend and I were looking through the edge of the clearing, and he grabbed me. He nodded across the water, and when I looked, I saw what seemed to be a woman standing just at the tree line. She was maybe 150 yards away. We assumed that she must live somewhere nearby, and so we continued walking past the water and clearing. As we headed back into the woods, I looked over my shoulder at where she was standing, but she was gone. The sounds of the forest returned once we got into the trees. We made a campsite about two miles past that as it was getting late and we didn't want to be stuck building a camp in the dark. We got everything unpacked and set up and built a fire, popped a couple beers and sat down to hang out. There was a girl that I was interested in on the trip and we had been flirting so after a few beers and the sun was down, we snuck away from the fire under the pretense that she wanted help setting up part of the tent. We started fooling around and after a few minutes she stopped and looked at me funny. I asked what was wrong and she said, nothing, it just got really quiet. We both quickly dressed and headed back outside to the fire. The others hadn't noticed anything strange and didn't mention anything wrong, except joking with us that it took us a long time to fix the tent. On the first morning, we found that the propane stove had been turned on, but not ignited and had gone empty overnight. None of us had used it. The second morning, we noticed some things had gone missing. A lantern we left outside by the fire was gone. My crush's sweatshirt that she left on a little folding chair slash stool. We figured we just misplaced things, or that someone had used them and put them somewhere else. During the second full day, Friday, we were looking for a waterfall that we read online was in the area. We were following the river upstream when everything went silent again. My buddy nudged me while we were walking and indicated up to the top of a hill next to the river. I looked up through the trees and was just able to make out the figure of the same woman, same clothes and all, just standing. I couldn't tell if she was looking at us or not, but she was standing there. 
My buddy told the girls that he saw a mountain lion following us and that he was going to go scare it off. He hustled up the hill, making a lot of noise, and came back about 10 minutes later. He said he scared it off to the girls, but told me aside that the woman wasn't there when he got up there. We found the waterfall and put it out of our minds as the girls decided to skinny dip in the river. We hiked back to camp and found it a mess. It wasn't totally trashed, but it was clear that something had gone into our stuff. We told the girls it was probably raccoons. We both took our guns to bed with us. That night, stuff went sideways. I remember waking up because my crush was squeezing my arm. We had been sleeping cuddled up together. I opened my eyes, and she hushed me before I could ask what was wrong. There was complete silence all around the tent. I looked across the tent, and my buddy was sitting halfway up looking around. We both stayed awake for the next two-ish hours until the sun started coming up, and then packed our stuff and we all headed out. The entire hike back to town was eerily silent. There were a couple of points that I thought that I saw the woman through the trees, but I never got a clear sight of her. We avoided the lake completely and got back into the truck in what seemed like half of the time that it took to get out to the camp. After we were safely on the road back home, the girls and my buddy all started to tell everyone about moments that they thought that they heard slash saw the woman all weekend, but were too freaked out to mention it out loud, like she would go away if we ignored her. The wild part was that none of us could describe her face. It's almost like it was blurry. I have no idea who she was, but I have never been camping or hiking at night ever since. I went camping by myself way out in the middle of nowhere in north central Pennsylvania. Drove on dirt forest service roads for over an hour. And then hiked about six miles in on a barely recognizable trail. There were no signs that anyone had been in the area recently. The trail was almost completely overgrown. No footprints. Spider webs everywhere, etc. I didn't really have a planned stopping point. I was just looking for a nice place to camp, but the trail followed a creek in a valley and was very rocky and not flat. As the sun is starting to set, I came upon a fork in the creek with a nice flat spot just on the other side. As I got closer, I saw all sorts of stuff laying about. I crossed the creek and started looking around. There was a tarp on the ground by a stone fire ring, a log about a foot in diameter that had been chopped with an ax. A little bit away, I found the entire contents of what you'd imagine to find in a hiker's backpack. Food, a cooking set, camping pad, first aid kit, etc. All strewn about on the ground, but no backpack in sight. There was a pile of clothes down by the creek that looked like it had just sat through the last rain, which was the day prior, and a towel hanging from a tree. There was an area that had clearly been used as a toilet for maybe 10 to 14 days based on the amount of toilet paper piles. The strangest thing, though, was this cage about four foot square made out of saplings tied together. It was framed where the edges of a cube would be and then had crossbars diagonally on each face. But it wouldn't have kept anything inside because of how much open space there was and obviously wouldn't have been very sturdy since it was only made from saplings. I ended up deciding to set up camp there because it was nearly dark and I didn't really have much choice unless I wanted to hike out in the dark on an unrecognizable trail. I had a 12 inch knife on me and I kept that thing in one hand the whole time that I was there thinking that some crazy guy was going to jump out and try and eat me. All night I barely slept and kept thinking that I was hearing things and then as soon as the sun came up I packed up and got the F out of there. Everything turned out fine. No crazy cannibals or anything. But it still really bugs me because I don't know what that stupid wooden cube frame cage thing was. I called the forest service for the area and told them about it. I even sent them pictures. They said they'd send a ranger in to check it out and clean it up. But I never followed up to see if they figured out what it was. The ranger on the phone told me that it was probably either someone with a still nearby 
someone growing pot, or just some loner living out in the woods. I roamed up the sides of the valley before I set up camp and didn't see anything. A still seems unlikely because of how far you would have to carry equipment in, and the area really isn't great for growing pot. So maybe it was just some guy living out in the woods. But why the cage? If there's any interest, I can probably find the pictures. Oh yeah, and last year I was camping out in Colorado and woke up at about 2 a.m. to a pack of coyotes running through my camp howling. Sounded like at least 20 of them. My dog was asleep next to me the entire time. Probably best that he didn't wake up though. He would have gone nuts. And I'm told that coyotes are much bolder in packs. I went to Shenandoah National Park in Virginia with a college buddy. JMU was super close, so he and I took some camping gear from work and headed up there to catch that Perseid meteor shower. We hiked a good ways in, on, and out and back trail that ended up with a cliff overlooking the Blue Ridge Mountains and was awestruck. I set up my two-person tent and he rigged his hammock with a tarp a few yards back and then we sat on a cliff and watched the stars go by. Here's where life got real for me. We go to bed pretty early that night, and around what I could only guess was 3 a.m., I start hearing tapping sounds all around my tiny tent. Now I knew it wasn't rain or him playing a joke on me, so I started to panic a little. At this point, I've been fully awake and alert for 10 minutes, and I can easily hear his tapping. I finally grow a pair and decided to turn on my flashlight, and what do I see when looking straight up through the mesh top of this tent? Hundreds and hundreds of centipedes. They were falling like a gentle drizzle all around my tent, and I felt like I was on an episode of Fear Factor. Long story short, I didn't sleep that night, obviously, but my buddy, who was about 15 feet away, was out like a rock. In the morning, there were dead centipedes everywhere. I'm normally fine with bugs and insects, but not swarms. I don't know how we didn't see any centipede carcasses the day before or when setting up camp. I went on a group retreat type thing over a fall weekend about eight years ago. My husband and I and our three girls, all under age 10. This was an annual occurrence, but we were flush that year as a result of our company doing well. As a result, we avoided the communal bunkhouses and decided to rent a camper. The RV rental place explained that it would cost the same for three nights as it would for two, so we decided we'd return it on Monday, despite the retreat being over earlier on Sunday. So the weekend went great. It was super hot and we were happy to have AC. We didn't notice it at the time. Different people being in and out all day, not staying in the RV much over the weekend because of activities. But the previous renters hadn't bothered to clear out the septic lines in the camper. By 6 o'clock Sunday evening, it stunk horribly and was backing up into the toilet. My husband was anxious about the rental company blaming us, so he decided to go to the Walmart in the neighboring town for some Drano. Mind you, this particular location, while open all year, is rarely occupied outside of retreats. I'll confess that we haven't been back since this occasion, so the details of why don't really come to mind. But as I recall, it was privately owned by a church in the area, and they used it mostly for their own purposes and events. So, my husband leaves around 8.30pm for Walmart. It's an hour plus round trip thanks to the rural area and skinny back roads. I start straightening the camper, packing our belongings and getting the kids settled. He'd been gone for about 40 minutes when I had gotten everything squared away and delivered the last glass of water to an overexcited child who'd been on the move all day and was having trouble relaxing. I curled up in the bed to read and wait for my husband to get back in case he needed help. The lights had been out for about 20 minutes when I started hearing a clicking sound coming from the window behind the bed. 
I stilled instantly and ran through a self-reassuring checklist. It's the trees scraping against the glass. Nature. A sound in the environment nearby. Or an axe murderer. That was option two. I got up and walked very slowly to the kitchen. The noise followed. As I was climbing up into the loft area over the trunk can, I hear the door handle rattle and then the scraping sound. I'd gotten a knife as I passed through the kitchen, which I was sweatily clutching as I hauled down on the edge of the bed in the loft, guarding my children. I eyed the cabin, making sure every access point was locked and hoped that whoever it was, it was definitely a whoever at this point, would go away. I leaned left and right, trying to get signal on my cell phone to call camp security or my husband or anyone, but it wouldn't dial. I waited, panicking. It was about five minutes of torture later that I saw headlights through the portholes on the side. Coming along, the winding road to the RV sites, and my husband entered the cabin, looking at me weird. He scoffed at me for being a city girl and told me that people didn't break out of prison and attack women and children in random rural campgrounds. I expressed that I'd heard the door rattling and that it wasn't a coincidence of nature, but he brushed me off. We passed the test of the night without incident, though I was too on edge to sleep. The next morning, we drove into the town to return the RV. On the once-over, demanded by the rental agreement, the manager came around to my husband and asked if he knew what had happened to the rear window. It seems that someone had used a switchblade or some similar item to remove the gasket from around the window where the back bedroom was, where I'd been reading the night before. There were gashes in the paint consistent with knife marks, and the gasket had been sliced off. The window lock was also damaged. It seems whoever had done it had also tried inserting the knife into the door's lock and between the jam and the lock in another attempt to gain entry. Fortunately, they didn't get in, and we were not charged for the damage to the RV. Needless to say, I never consented to a solo camping trip again, and I always go in a larger group now. Safety and numbers and all that. But it still makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. In the late 80s, I was in my early 20s, and two friends and I went camping in Central Florida. Two of us were working for the Park Service at that time, so we were able to camp for free in other parks in the state. Both of us had done a lot of camping before. Me, I grew up camping with my family on every single vacation, all over the state. For the other friend with us, this was her first camping trip ever. We were camping in the youth area, which was empty that weekend and was quieter and more isolated than the regular campsites. Later in the afternoon, on the second day of our trip, we were all sort of spread out in the area of the campsite, being within shouting distance but enjoying a little solitude. I was collecting firewood. Every now and then, I'd kind of feel like someone was watching me. I'd look around, see and hear nothing, and then shrug it off and just go back to what I was doing. Later on, around sunset, we had the bonfire started. One of the rangers who lived on site, about a quarter of a mile away, came over with a truckload of firewood and a six-pack of beer. We all sat around talking for a while. Well after dark, we could suddenly hear what was probably a bunch of teenagers fooling around on one of the trails a couple of miles away. Since the trails were closed at sunset, the ranger and my coworker drove off to shoo them back to their campsites. My other friend and I were just relaxing around the fire, talking a little, mostly enjoying the night and the peace and quiet. All of a sudden, I had a cold chill go over me. The hair stood up on the back of my neck, and out of nowhere, I was terrified. I tried to ignore it, but it kept building. I didn't say anything to my friend. I didn't want to scare her. Then I glanced over at her just as she glanced at me, and she said, Do you feel that? I said, Yeah. 
I think maybe we'd better go to the car. We both felt like we were in deadly danger, but no idea from what. We started walking at a casual pace, not wanting to appear scared. Then, halfway to the car, we looked at each other again and simultaneously broke into a dead run. We reached the car, jumped in and locked the doors, and turned on the headlights. I just sat there with my pistol, feeling like it was totally inadequate for whatever was out there. We both just sat, looking straight ahead. We were afraid to look around. I had the feeling at one point that if I turned my head and looked out the window, I'd see something that would drive me insane. I don't know how long we sat there. It was probably just a few minutes, but it felt like forever. Then it just left. We could actually feel it going away. A few minutes after that, the other two came back in the truck. We kind of laughed it off afterward, but I'll tell you, I've never been that scared before or since. I've faced a lot in my life, and nothing has so completely terrified me like that. I don't know what it was, but I'm still convinced that we were in terrible danger. I lived by a state park as a kid, one of those places super close to a city, so it's very overhiked. Like, you can't walk a single minute without passing several other people. This area eventually leads up into a vast mountainous area, but that's many, many miles away. Rumors of wild pigs, but no bears, and the most dangerous thing are rattlesnakes that just want to be left alone. All that to set up for this point. Wildlife has been basically chased out of their refuge. The biggest animal I had seen was a squirrel until I was 10 years old. The first incident, my dad and I were taking the slightly less used path. It was basically an out of the way trial that ended the same, but was rougher, no bicycles, and an added risk of seeing the aforementioned rattlesnakes. I was watching my footing when my dad let out an, oh crap. I looked up and saw two of the biggest bucks I have ever seen in person. This is a no hunting park, so really big. And we were really close as my dad had been watching out for me. My dad is desperately looking around for a tree that I would learn later while I go, oh dear. Sedina, no. My dad yells as I step towards the deer so I can see if they're friendly. One lowers his head and I'm thinking it wants to be petted. My dad realizes that I'm closer to the deer than I am to him, and this causes him to freak out. The deer are focused on me, one head down still, till a branch hits it across the face. It barely phases it, though the other one takes off immediately. After some cursing from my dad, it finally prances away like no big deal. My dad was convinced that the buck was about to charge me, I got an education that day, that even nice animals can be dangerous. I would learn that lesson again with a nice herd of cows on the beach a year later. Later that fall, a mountain lion was spotted from a very busy trail, kind of far, but it's been like 20 years since a sighting. It turns out, despite the crowds of people, conservation efforts were paying off. By the time I was in my 20s, deer were jumping in our backyard to eat our roses. Owls were nexting right next to the main parking lot. The wild pigs weren't rumors anymore. The lions could be heard screaming in the distance at night. And the rattlesnakes still just wanted to be left alone. I really love through hiking and climbing, so I sleep outside for a great part of summer each year, almost never using tents because they're super heavy and also prohibited at most parts of my mountains. I had many scary encounters with animals, mostly due to the inhuman shrieks that they can produce. But I tell you this, 
In all of nature, nothing is so scary as people. This is why I prefer camping deep in the woods to being just outside of the city limits. Because it's always better to find family of wild hogs going through your stuff at 3 a.m. than to find a family of coked out drug addicts going through your stuff at 3 a.m. But anyways, here are two of the stories of encountering people that came to my mind. The first one. We were actually using tents because this was a more of a get together and get drunk sort of thing with my classmates at a nearby lake. So the night is surely upon us. So we decide to gather some wood in the nearby forest to keep the fire going through the night. Me and my pal take on this task. And as we approach the woods, we see that there is another tent pitched right outside of the site of our camping site. As we pass it, a dude pops out of the tent. We make small friendly chat about us staying there and him just camping and whatnot. And then we excuse ourselves that we need to get some wood for the fire. All fine and dandy. Nothing unusual. Camping folks are usually chatty and friendly. Except for two things. By the setup of the tent and campground, he must have been there for a few days and he planned to stay there for a while, which is okay. There are a lot of photographers doing this, as the place is famous for its sunrises. Although I still shiver thinking about all the heavy tarps lying around. And secondly, he advises us to split, as there were two paths going through the woods, so that we can cover more ground. Which we did, because why not? It looked like he knew the area. So I'm walking alone through the woods, my friend taking the other path, which is directly above mine, and he could still see down my trail. When I hear him shout my name, I turn around to see what's happening, and I see the guy from the tent following me on the trail, which he saw from above, wielding a machete. The guy says that after we left, he realized that we didn't have any axe or anything to chop down the wood, although we said collecting the wood, also chopping it down would be illegal there. So he thought that he would help me with that, which I politely refused and got the heck out of there, meeting my mate who was already on this route earlier. So we came back to the camping site with next to no fuel for the fire, and everyone keeps making fun of us, that we're paranoid and the guy just surely wanted to help. Whatever. We proceed to drink and night falls. We had almost forgotten about the incident, and all is well again when I see a headlamp approaching our campsite. It's that guy from the tent coming to our site. He's bearing a bunch of wood in his arms, saying that he knew that we didn't take much of the fuel, so he brought us some. Then he walks all around our campsite before putting it down. I mean, there was really no need for that as the fire was in the middle. Checking the tents, asking whether this is all of us, and if someone else is coming. Not creepy at all. After a moment of uncomfortable silence, he tells us to enjoy our night and gets out. Understandably, everybody is creeped out by now, and different theories pop up, such as that he brought the wood, only to make sure that he wouldn't kill the fire before we go to sleep, so that he knows when that happens, or that the occasional flash from the direction of his campsite is the flash from his binoculars. Well, no one went to sleep that night, and we were not drinking anymore. After the sun went up, we took our two-hour nap rotating guards, and we packed our stuff and left as soon as possible. The other one. We were on a climbing trip and slept under the stars really deep in the woods and well off all of the well-known trails and places in the areas, as sleeping there is prohibited, and the rangers are very strict about this, issuing very large fines if they catch you. So essentially, we were hiding deep in the woods. We cooked some great dinner. Man, nothing tastes as good as an MRE after a full day of climbing, camped out in the mountains. We drank some wine. We talked for a bit, and we went to sleep as we were really tired. At about 2 a.m., we were all woken up. There was four of us. We were woken up by voices. It sounded like a school trip somewhere in the distance. Lots of kids talking to each other, presumably walking in a group. That itself was super scary. A bunch of kids walking in the woods at 2 a.m. 
and they must have been off any trail, as we went on purpose out of reach of any known trails. No one is talking. We all sit there and listen. The voices pass. Then the second wave of similar group of voices passes nearby, and then we hear someone approach our sight through the woods. There must be more of them based on the sounds they're making. And then it happened. It was a group of five kids, roughly 13 years old, walking in the direction of the voices. They walk around our site, silently greeting us and nodding in our direction as they pass about three meters from our sleeping bags and continue towards all the voices. To make it all more creepy, none of them had any headlamps or flashlights or any sources of light. It was a full moon, so the visibility was good, but still. I have no idea what was that supposed to mean, but it was really weird and honestly scary. It could have been some scouts as well that was well-established outdoorsy place, the whole area. But still, a bunch of kids alone in the woods, well off of any well-known trail, walking without any source of light at 2 a.m., just right by us, That's creepy. There are lots of weird things happening when you camp. But trust me, nothing is as scary as other human beings. I'm pretty late to the party but my mother has a great camping story. In their late 20s, her and my father were teaching in Lesotho. On the holidays, they would go on camping trips in the massive parks in Zimbabwe. They were young and stupid and didn't know the dangers of camping in Africa. And they had my sister with them, who would have been less than a year old at the time. One night, they were camping in a tent and my sister was between them when they heard sounds inside. They say it sort of sounded like someone coughing. My sister was making baby noises, and it seemed like it attracted more coughing animals outside. Soon, it sounded like a whole pack of something was outside the tent. My parents had no firearms and no knife or axe close by. One of the animals then started sniffing the tent, and it seems like it was trying to dig under it to get to my now crying sister. My panicked parents were trying to find a way to save themselves and my sister. And in a panic-induced rage, my mother, with all the might and glory that only a mother who is scared for her child's life can produce, punches the snout of the hyena sniffing the tent. To this day, my parents swear that the animal screamed in terror, and the whole pack ran off. Growing up in the woods and going camping, my family and I have had our fair share of bizarre and scary stories. This one, I just can't seem to wrap my head around, even to this day. My parents own 35 acres of property in the Deep Rockies, about two to three hours away from our home. We spent as much time as we could camping there, as we all loved it. It was secluded and beautiful, and we had a lot of freedom there as kids. My parents were both experienced campers and backpackers and had both grown up in the mountains. One day we head up at night, arriving at the property at around 9 or 10 p.m. We were all pretty tired and start to unpack the tents and such from the car. The minute we get out, though, we all get a strange feeling. It didn't seem normal or good. We had encountered wild predators at this point and knew the feeling of being watched. But this was like being watched from all sides. We also all notice that there are no sounds. It is dead silent. Normally, we would be hearing all of the insects and occasional howls, night hawks, or bats, and just the general hum of a forest. Nothing too serious. We all kind of laughed nervously and maybe mentioned a few things, but got to work setting up our tents nearby. This is when the real strange stuff starts to happen. We begin to hear rustling in the branches around us, about 10 feet off the ground, it seems. 
It almost sounded like large creatures like monkeys or raccoons jumping from tree to tree loudly. And many of them. I have never seen raccoons have the ability to do something like that. And these sounds were clumsy, unlike birds. It gets louder and louder and becomes extremely unnerving. At this point, the tent is set up and my parents put my brother and I there, telling us to stay inside. They go out with flashlights, trying to make sense of this bizarre activity. As they're outside, we start to hear these bizarre calls. I've never heard anything like this before or since. Honestly, it almost sounded like humans mimicking some kind of primate holler or screech. There was an odd human-like aspect to it, and it's like they were calling and responding to each other from every direction, along with the branches crackling and rustling. My parents came back to the tent and tell us that they couldn't see anything at all. I remember how shocked and frightened my mom looked, and it scared me because she was not scared of anything, and she would stalk bears just to get a good photo. Both of my parents were not easily frightened in nature, or at all. We're all huddled together in the tent, confused, scared, and unsure of what to do. The sounds are so loud, and everywhere, it almost sounds like some crazy storm outside. Our dogs are covered in between us all, totally freaked out. My dad decides to go out again, and I remember as he finishes unzipping the tent, the sounds stop, just like that, in an instant, and the oppressive, weird feeling is gone. He and my mom go out again to investigate, and again find nothing, except fallen branches and some strange marks up high on some trees. They come back, talk us down, and somehow manage to get us asleep. We still talk about this to this day. None of us know what happened and have no explanation. Like I said, we had some crazy and strange things happen to us, but never anything remotely similar to what happened that night. I was living in Brazil, and a friend and I decided to do a one night out and back through mountainous rainforest terrain in one of the southern states. We mostly wanted to get some exercise and do a gear shake out before going on a longer trip in Patagonia. The experience started out really tough. We were doing almost constant climbing and it was hot. Humidity was near 100% through lush vegetation. Eventually, we were pretty much in clouds and completely drenched from sweat and humidity. It was kind of hellish, soaked to the bone with no chance of drying out. Fortunately, at that altitude, it gets below freezing quite frequently at night, so there weren't many insects or animals, only birds. We hiked for probably eight hours with little progress. It was slow going through tough terrain. At early evening, we came to a flat spot the first we'd seen in hours, and decided to make camp as it was starting to pour. I basically made camp in several inches of standing water. I was beat anyways, so I just sat in my tent reading. At around 3 a.m., I woke up to a girl singing in the distance. The singing kept coming closer until she was singing right at our tents. She pushed past us, and the singing drifted off. She was singing maybe a lullaby or a children's song about rain in Portuguese, but it sounded very strange. An hour later, I got woken up to the singing in the distance again. She was coming back towards us, singing the same rain song. As she passed us, I could hear a little exasperation in her voice. She continued singing and went back in the direction of the trailhead. Another hour later, I was again woken up by her singing as she was again coming back towards us, except now she was also crying. She continued to cry and sing as she moved past us for the final time. We woke up that morning, looked at each other, said what the heck was that, and then got on our way. It was very eerie at the time, and I don't have an explanation for it. 
we were in an extremely isolated location, and the trail was definitely only used by recreational hikers. So I really can't say why this woman was out wandering, singing, and crying at 3 a.m. My family has a cabin. It's really just an old mobile home in the middle of the woods in northern Michigan. We've had it for years and years, but only recently some unexplained odd things have happened, and the police have been out to search the place. The last time I went to the cabin was the worst experience. I went up with my friend. For context purposes, we're two girls in our late 20s, and we arrived at dark. We got out and unloaded but had trouble turning on the power. It has an outside electrical box because the lock was frozen shut. We were trying to get it unstuck, but kept hearing noises around the cabin. Finally, it sounded like the noises were very close to us. And as we weren't getting anywhere with the lock, we rushed inside in case it was a bear milling around. We sat inside for maybe five minutes before deciding to drive out to the nearest town to get a motel for the night. We would come back once it was light to get the power on. We grabbed a few things and headed back out to the car. I got in and turned the car on, but nothing. The car was 100% unresponsive. The doors wouldn't even lock. My car had absolutely no issues. We had just driven three hours to the cabin without any problems. Something had to have happened to the car in the few minutes that we were inside. I told my friend we needed to get back inside. We got to the door and locked up behind us. We looked at each other, suddenly scared. Our car was totally dead. We had absolutely zero cell phone service and we had no power. We tried to stay calm. We made a new game plan. We were just going to rough it for the night. And then, at first light, walk in the direction of civilization until we got cell signal or ran in to help. Only a short time later, we were sitting together in the living room, quietly talking. Suddenly, there was two sharp, loud knocks on the back door of the cabin. We absolutely both froze. We sat there, horrified and shaking, just waiting for someone to push their way into the door or window. This was a mobile home so it would take very minimal effort to break in. We were met with only silence, but now knew someone was outside. What did they want? It was much scarier to think that they hadn't broke in. They just potentially sabotaged our car and were now knocking on our door to toy with us. We sat, silent and terrified. After a while, we started talking again only to have someone bang on a window. Just one loud smack. I've never been so scared in my life. We quickly realized that we had to stay alert and awake until morning. We just had to hope that whoever was outside didn't try to get in. It didn't, but the pattern of the knocks on the window continued for hours. As soon as the sun was up, we ventured outside. We took a look under the hood of my car next. It turns out the bolt that clamps the metal piece to the battery terminal was loosened almost completely. The nut was all the way loosened. One or two turns more and it would have fallen off completely. Thank you so much for listening to all of the stories in this video. I hope you enjoyed them. I also hope that you enjoy the extra rain at the end. Have a good night, everyone. And I'll read to you in the next video. Good night now.